Hi, welcome to Intermolecular Forces, Solids and Liquids. My name is Dr. English. Today we're going to look specifically at heating curves. So, overview of heating and cooling curves. Heating curves as endothermic processes. The melting point. Melting and heat of fusion. Boiling point. Boiling point and heat of vaporization. And finally, some practice problems at the end. Overview of heating and cooling curves. Heating and cooling curves are used to show energy exchanges between the system and the surroundings during phase changes. The phase change diagrams used here involve the transformation of ice into water vapor and later on water vapor into ice. Remember, matter generally exists in three phases, solid, liquid, and gas. The phase of a substance, whether it is a solid, liquid, or gas, at any given time depends on the conditions of temperature and pressure. As either or both of these conditions change, the substance may change physical phase. Heating curves. If a solid heats evenly over a period of time, a graph of the different temperatures taken at different times will look like the graph below. As heat is added, the temperature of the solid rises, indicating that the heat energy being used to increase the average kinetic energy of the particles from T0 to T1. So from T0 to T1, we are only in the solid phase. Everything is a solid. There is no liquid whatsoever, but those particles as kinetic energy is increasing, they are going to move faster and faster. And if we take the temperature of those particles from the time of T0 to T1, we'll see that the temperature is increasing. At point T1, the melting point temperature of the solid has been reached, which we can see here on the graph. And the substance is still 100% in the solid phase. So right at the melting point, right exactly at T1, everything is a solid and there is no liquid whatsoever. Now, from T1 to T2, the solid is going to melt over time. During melting, which we also refer to as fusion, a specific amount of heat energy is added to the solid to convert it into a liquid. This is known as the heat of fusion and is represented as a capital H and a subscripted lowercase f. So from T1 to T2, we're going to see both a solid and a liquid exist during this time. 334 joules of heat energy is needed to convert each gram of ice into liquid water. In other words, it's being absorbed because this is an endothermic process. Because the heat now increases, only the potential energy, the temperature remains constant, which is really, really, really important to notice. So from T1 to T2, we'll see that flat part of the curve, flat part of the curve. And that flat part of the curve means that your kinetic energy, your temperature is staying constant, but your potential energy is increasing because all that energy is going into breaking apart those water molecules, breaking apart those intermolecular forces. Finally, at point T2, all the substance is a liquid. Between T2 and T3, the liquid, again, is being warmed up. Kinetic energy is increasing, and as a result, the temperature is increasing. At T3, the boiling point temperature has been reached. In the interval from T3 to T4, the liquid is changing to a gas. And again, this is known as vaporization. We'll see boiling. Both phases are present during this time interval. So from T3 to T4, you'll notice both liquid and gas being present. During boiling, otherwise known as vaporization, a specific amount of heat energy the heat of vaporization, HV, is needed to convert a liquid to a gas. As each gram of water is converted into steam, 2,260 joules of energy are absorbed. We get that from reference table B. Because the heat now increases only the potential energy, 
the temperature remains constant. And again, if we look at our diagram here, we notice from T3 to T4 that we have a flat line. Temperature is remaining constant because kinetic energy is remaining constant, but potential energy is increasing. At T4, the substance is all a gas. With further heating, the kinetic energy increases and the temperature will ultimately increase. Remember, fusion and vaporization are endothermic processes. Let's do a practice problem. How much heat energy is required to melt 200 grams of ice? So we're going to use the formula Q equals MHF, which is the heat of fusion found on reference table T, and we're going to use the heat of fusion value found on table B, which is 334 joules per one gram of water. So we're going to rewrite our formula, Q equals MHF. We're going to substitute in our values. Our mass is 200 grams of ice. We're going to multiply that times our heat of fusion, which is 334 joules per gram. We'll notice here that grams cancel grams, so we're left with joules, which is what we want. And if we multiply these two things together, we get 66,800 joules of energy, which is to the correct number of significant figures because we have three significant figures here, and we need to end with three significant figures at the end. Could we put this into scientific notation? Of course we could. Let's look at another example. How much heat energy is required to convert 20 grams of water to steam at 100 degrees Celsius? Now, don't get distracted by the 100 degrees Celsius. That's just the boiling point of water, which is basically saying to us, hey, use Q equals MHV, which is the formula on reference table T that we need to use. So Q equals MHV, where the heat of vaporization is 2,260 joules per gram. Our mass here is 20 grams of liquid water. We're going to multiply that times our heat of vaporization, which is 2,260 joules per gram. Grams cancel grams. And if we multiply these together, our Q is 45,200 joules. And again, we could put that into scientific notation if we wanted to. So what did you learn? We did an overview of heating and cooling curves. We talked about heating curves as an endothermic process. We talked about melting point, melting in the heat of fusion, boiling point, boiling point in the heat of fusion, and a few practice problems at the end. Need more help? Feel free to contact me. Have a great day.